Hi guys. Hi. Uh... Hi guys. Uh, I'm James. I'm one of the F ones from uh, uh, over in Bradford. Um, I didn't train in Leeds. Trained in London. So um, I've never done countdown to finals. I've been made aware that it's it's trying to lead you off to F1, which I think is a very good thing to do before finals. Um, I just want to give a piece of advice: don't don't panic. It's fairly easy. Uh, they've they've been training for five six years. They don't want you to fail. Um, as long as you don't have your head up your backside, you're absolutely fine. Um, it's great to see all you out as well. Um, right, so my lecture today is on GI bleeds and your acute abdomen. Um, most of it is fairly straight. Actually, all of it is fairly straightforward. You, for finals, you need to know a fairly shallow amount about a lot of things. So you need to have a really wide base of knowledge, but quite a, 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 a shallow depth, as it were. So I'm expecting you all to know way more than I do about these things. As an F1, I can put cannulas in, I can put NG tubes in, but knowledge-wise, it kind of goes out the window after about six or seven weeks. Okay, so to begin with, contents. So we're going to go through lower and upper GI bleeds, uh, the acute abdomen, and then in about six or seven months, uh, your role as the, uh, as the F1. I think um, it's always best to have these things as interactive as possible. Um, I know last week, whoever it was that was lecturing you um, decided to pick on those who unfortunately had to wear glasses um, <laughs> for whatever reason. I don't, I don't know what he has against them. Um, I'm going to do mine slightly differently. So, um, lower GI G G bleeds will go through very, very quickly first. Um, it's something you'll see a lot of on SAU or A&E. Um, you'll see people come in with PR bleeding. People get very scared of PR bleeding for right or wrong reasons. <laughs> Um, so we'll start with a few causes of uh, lower GI bleeds, which tend to be more superficial. So we'll start with the very first person who will be the lady who just looked away from me in the third row, just there, who's now still looking away from me, and now looking around. Oh yeah. No, 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 in the third row. You, you, you're, all right, you're, 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 you're just not, not, not with me at all, are you? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, I just wanted you to name a few causes of lower GI bleeds. Cancer can cause it. It's very, very, uh, it's, it's, it's low down on the list, but yeah, cancer can cause it. Um, any more? Hemorrhoids. Who is that that said that? Someone up there. Don't know. Really know. Fine. Hemorrhoids. Yeah. That's 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 exactly it. Um, anyone else? Any other causes? <coughs> IBD, yeah, so Crohn's and uh, UC, that are often the primary uh, presenting cause. You'll get someone come in with a with a GI bleed, uh, sorry, with a with a uh, fresh red blood um, associated with abdominal pain, etc. Um, any others? Anyone can think of diverticulitis. Yes, one of the other ones. Fine. So one only one that people didn't mention were the anal, anal fissures, um, which you'll see. Don't confuse an anal fissure with anal fistula which lots of F1 seem to do um, just out of interest how many people here know the difference between a fissure and a fistula just I'm hoping everyone I'm really hoping everyone all right so basically a, uh, a fissure is just a, a, a slice or a cut into the um, the anal ring um, whereas a fistula is, is a connection between uh, two two places which shouldn't be connected basically Okay, so we'll move on from lower GI bleeds. Get out there. Right. To upper GI bleeds. Um, gentlemen in the front row, can you name us some causes of upper GI bleeds? Gastric ulcer. Perfect. Uh, gastric and, and um, duodenal ulcers account for most all of upper GI bleeds. Uh, can you pick a letter between A and H for me? Please. J. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. And a number between one and ten. Nine. So B one two three four five six seven eight nine. Gentlemen in the in the glasses. Right. Um, okay. Uh, one more, please. Mallory Vice Yeah. 
Um, another very common cause. Don't remember the exact percentage, but it will come up in a minute. Um, Mallory Vice Tears, do you know anything about Mallory Vice Tears? I'm assuming you do. Fine. Um, any more? <coughs> yeah, yeah. Esophageal varices, yeah, very dangerous. Account for probably about 5 to 10%, but those 5 or 10%, there's a, there's a quite high morbidity and mortality rate out of those. Um, anyone think of any others? Yeah, yeah, perforation, yeah, yeah. That's normally secondary to things like peptic or duodenal ulcers or. Um, I did. I did have a lady come in a few weeks ago who had. Um, who uh, she was coming up from A and E. I was clerking her in from SAU, and she had um, perforation, uh, query anal sex, and um, it was by far the most horrific thing I've ever seen in my whole life. Um, I think I have her X-ray coming up for you in a bit, actually. Okay, so duodenal gastric ulcers. Esophagitis, no one said, that's quite a common cause. Mallory vice tear, esophageal varices, and upper GI malignancies account for about 3%. Okay, so common symptoms. Gentlemen in the glasses, could you pick a letter from A to H, please? <laughs> C, and a number? C, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Gentlemen in the shirt. Can you name a few common symptoms you might see from upper or lower front? What? Upper GI bleeds in a patient. Blood, yep, yep, hematemesis. So it's a frank, fresh red blood. There are signs of things like esophageal varices, even Mallory vice tears. Um, have you got any others? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in, in terms of what are we thinking at that point? Exactly, that's fine. Yeah. Um, yep, yep. Okay, so in, in terms of the, the quality of the bleeding, as in fresh red blood compared to something like coffee ground vomit, for example, um, everyone here is aware of what coffee ground vomit looks like. It's fairly, fairly descriptive. It, it does, it looks very much like hard ground coffee granules. Um, that's, as I'm sure you're aware, is uh, the product of blood being digested, basically, and just coming straight back up. Uh, another product, uh, another symptom caused by blood being digested might be melina. Has anyone ever come in contact, well, not come in contact with melina? Well, you may have. Has anyone ever come in contact with melina? You, I, for those of you that haven't, Melina is by far the worst thing you can ever come in contact with. I had, I had a friend who was doing a PR on someone with Melina who uh, it, it just, as they pulled out, it exploded and just went all over them. Um, yeah, it was, it was horrible. This, the, 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 this now never, never quite leaves you, I, I, I've got to say. I actually wish I didn't bring that up. <laughs> Fine. So other, other, other uh, more subtle ones, things like lethargy, anemia, you'll, you'll see that with, with, with patients with chronic um, GI bleeds. <coughs> abdominal pain is fairly nondescript. We'll, we'll, we'll go through abdominal pain a bit, a bit more in, in detail later on. Okay, so case number one, 22-year-old male presents with A&E with hematemesis. He was out with friends the previous night and had a few too many. He had several episodes of vomiting today, the last of which contained a moderate volume of fresh red blood. The gentleman in the shirt that I was talking to before, uh, can you pick a letter for me? E. E1, <laughs> e the lady with the stripy jumper. What should, what's, what's the very first, you've taken a history, albeit brief. Uh, we're not going to examine him at the moment. What's the next thing we need to do? What, what's, what's the thing that probably you've been done before you get there by one of the nurses? Observations, right, so his obs are those. Are you happy with those? Okay, so what should his BP be? Yep, should pretty much bang on. Heart rate, is that okay? Respirate, what should the parameters of respirate be?
Yeah, that's fine. I mean, most m most places will accept between 12 and 20, but uh, yeah, 16 to 20 is fine. And SAT's 99, that's pretty self-explanatory. So next test you would do on a patient like this, quite an easy bedside test that you will take. Some hospitals get the results back very, very quickly. Some take days. Okay, uh, bloods is next. So this gentleman's bloods come back instantly, bedside. These are the only ones we really care about at the moment. Are we happy with those? Is anyone unhappy with those? Fine, so all at once, are you worried? No. Initial management, anyone think of anything you'd like to do for this gentleman? Through the silence, you're correct, nothing. Uh, provisional diagnosis. Fine, given away very easily by the first couple of lines. Fine, good. So Mallory Vice Tear, as the gentleman over there pointed out, esophageal tear is most commonly caused by repeated vomiting. Usually acute and self-limiting requires no intervention. You'll get a lot of people, 20, between 20 and 30, will come in saying I'm vomiting blood, very quickly turn them back around and send them home. Um, that won't be your decision as an F1, by the way. But you, you, if, if you suggest it, then uh, your seniors will be happy with you. Case number two. So, uh, lady with the stripy jumper we were just talking to, would you mind picking a letter for me? Okay, and a number? Six, seven, eight. Lady in the black jumper. So, 52-year-old female alcoholic presents to SAU after vomiting fresh red blood at home. She has never had this before. Reports black, smelly stools yesterday, which is what? Abdominal examination reveals ascites and caput medusa. Caput medusa is a sign of... Brilliant. Uh, during your consultation, she has a large volume hematemesis. Right, so we're, 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 we're talking in terms of your EMQs at the end of the year. The EMQs, like I said, the medical school doesn't want to fail you, so they're just going to, they're, they're going to throw these things out, all right? Black smelly stools equals melina equals GI bleed, all right? You're already there. Alcoholic equals basically just one thing. For the sake of this question, we'll carry on. So we're going to do some OBS. So are we happy with those? No. Not particularly bad. 95 over 60 isn't, isn't the end of the world. A 52-year-old lady with 95 over 60, if this was a, a, an 18-year-old with a BP of 95 over 60, would we be more worried? Why? <laughs> they do. They compensate. You'll see, you'll see uh, 20, 25-year-olds bleeding from every orifice with BPs of 120 over 80 and then all of a sudden it just goes and it all hell breaks loose. So we'll take some bloods from her. HB of 78 and urea of 12. Are we happy with those? No. What sort of picture is this painting for us? Yeah. Brilliant. Really good. What we need is her previous bloods. Okay, if she's just constantly for the last six months just coasting along at HB of 78, that might not mean anything. If she's gone from HB of 78, if she's gone from HB of 140 two days ago to HB of 78, we're in big trouble. Urea of 12, does anyone know why urea goes up in gastro bleeds? Brilliant, great. See, you're, you're all basically ready already. Are you worried? Yeah. You worried? Yep, yeah, fine. Uh, initial management and investigation. So this lady could be potentially sick, couldn't she? So what what do you want to do for her? Um, yeah, yeah. Any fluids in particular? Anything, literally anything. They, you'll, you'll, you, you may have lectures about fluids. I'm sure you'll have lectures about fluids in this. You could go on for hours. Different anaesthetists say different things. Just as the F1, anything you can get in is fine. Um, anything else you'd want for her? You would, yeah, you definitely want to do an OGD. Probably wouldn't be the first thing you do now, but you, you could <coughs> request it and get it done ASAP. A differential diagnosis for this lady. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yep, could definitely be a perforated ulcer. Okay. In this case, esophageal varices is correct. So similar to uh, caput medusa, the portal hypertension uh, causing the uh, 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 
can't remember which junction it is. I'm sure someone out there knows which junction the esophageal varices come up in. Um, yeah, so that it forms that. They're, they're friable. They're very friable. So you tend to get bleeds uh, quite commonly. Um, initial resus. So you've got fluids, green cannulas in each arm, at least green. Well, to be honest with you, green is the biggest you're going to be able to get on your first couple of weeks for definite. I have only put in two or three greys, and that was, you know, to an unconscious patient. So greens are, are fine. To be honest with you, anything is fine. Just get something into them. Urgent endoscopy. So the OGD you requested would be great. Um, that's, you'll be able to have a look down and see what's going on. You'll also be able to do some treatment, so you can band or you can, you can sclerose, depending on <coughs> what you see. Right, could also be a duodenal or gastric ulcer, like we said before. Uh, depending on the type of ulcer, it's between 60 and 90 percent are associated with H. pylori. Uh, duodenal are more common, um, lots of things. So if you had this patient who was on, she's on daily ibuprofen and you know. NSAIDs up to her eyes, those need to stop. <laughs> Snap, okay. <coughs> All GI bleeds are an emergency until proven otherwise. You need to get senior assistance. But, as the F1, you're able to do most things before the senior assistance gets there. You, what, you, what you have to remember, it's very easy when you first start to think, oh my God, this person's bleeding quick, I need to run around and get some help. You've always got five minutes, you've always got half an hour to an hour to just sit down and think and get all the appropriate things done because the senior assistant isn't going to be able to do anything more than you are in the first few minutes. So you need to get your IV access, you need to get your bloods off, you need to get whatever scans you need sent off, etc, etc. You can do, like you said, the ABCD approach is absolutely perfect. If you get this in an OSCU, if you get this in um, uh, Viva, if, you, if, if, if they're up here, you'll, ABCDE will, will get you through most situations. So, um, blood tests, standard, obviously in your group and save and cross match. Erect, erect chest x-ray and abdominal x-ray. Abdominal x-ray for, did anyone tell me? What's the, what's the main thing we're looking for in an abdominal x-ray in terms of acute abdominal, abdominal pain or bleeding? But yeah, obstruction is basically the only thing you'll really be able to get out of it. Erect chest x-ray, the one thing, perforation, brilliant. Uh, appropriate analgesia, people often forget analgesia. These patients are in a lot of pain, they've come to us for help. The very they need to be calmed down. The very first thing that's gonna calm them down is pain relief, that's that. Um, what you do next depends on their hemodynamic status. So this lady had fairly low blood pressure, so there's nothing wrong with giving her a fluid challenge slash a stat bag. Nothing wrong with that at all. You're not gonna get told off. She needs, uh, she needs blood if you're gonna do that. Bloods generally take about half an hour to 40 minutes depending on the hospital depending on where you are so get a bag of saline or colloids or whatever you can up. Um, it's just a way to tell whether or not the patient is going to die as it were when you're sending up someone for an OGD they'll ask you what the Rockall score is if the Rockall score is like you know more than seven <laughs> then you know they need to get up there now if it's less than three they may not even do it um, Glasgow Bachelor score is one that's seen less um, but still, they do use it in A&E. Um, just be aware that they exist. There's no need to learn them like, you know, the GCS or whatever. Um, do learn the GCS. I think that's a, that's a good idea for, not only for your exams, but for F1 in general. Because um, there's nothing worse than it's, you know, four in the morning, you've been called to see a patient and you can't even tell what GCS is. Okay, has anyone any questions on acute bleeding? No, sorry, on, on GI bleeding, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's, 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 it's all about the patient. With that first patient, obviously he was young, so you can't rely very much on the BP. First thing to go off on a young patient is the respiratory rate. If his respiratory rate was 25, 30, I'd be more worried. The fact that he's only had one episode of fresh red blood, and it's a small amount, and it, it tends to be quite streaky and quite kind of, it's, it's quite obvious they won't, they'll only do it once or twice as well. So if he's continually vomiting, and he's vomiting blood all the time, then you definitely need to get something else sorted. Um, like I said, it, it, it's about experience. As the F1, you're not gonna be sending this patient home full stop. It's never gonna be your decision. But you just need to know which patients you need to worry about, and he can be put to the back of your mind. Don't ignore him, obviously, but 
he can, he can be put to the back of your mind. Just, you know, he can be given analgesia, given half an hour to an hour OBS, and it should, should be fine. He's not someone you need to get the uh, reg out of theatre for, basically. Any other questions? Okay. So the acute abdomen, sorry, how are we doing for time? Fine. So the acute abdomen is um, any abdominal pain or illness associated with the abdomen, basically. So it, it covers a huge plethora of things. Uh, for today's lecture, we're going to go through the main ones that you're likely to see as an F1, and the main ones you're likely to get questions on in your um, exams. Um, I remember when I f first started, my first day, well, my first night was uh, a night shift as a surgical F1 on call, which in Bradford means you've got 200 patients to yourself and one reg in theatre, and it's honestly the scariest thing ever. So if I could just, just a third of you at least will have this experience within the first couple of weeks. So just, just get your head around the emergency situations and what needs to be done, and you'll be absolutely fine. Like I said, most patients, unless they're, you know, just had their throat cut or whatever, they're not going to die right in front of you. You've got time, okay? Okay, fine. So we're going to have a little bit of a... I couldn't find a male patient. Um, <laughs> I've just realised... Uh, but I'll just, yeah, we'll have to get over it. Right, so <coughs> most surgeons, for some reason, use the American vernacular and split it into right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, and left lower quadrant, which, to be honest, for an F1 works brilliantly because you can your, your anatomy goes out the window a little bit once you've had your six, six weeks off or whatever since finals and then you start. So um, just very quickly, the, the, the lady in the black jumper who we were talking to before, would you mind picking a letter? B and a number. You don't know which way I'm going from, by the way. So I know you're, you're, you're choosing. So you've, you've chosen her. So I, I might as well go her. Fine. Okay, so let's, let's do a nice easy one. Can you name for me a few of the things that you might find in the right upper quadrant? Good. Brilliant. Well done, A star. Anything else? Brilliant. Yeah, good. Yeah, the thing that connects the two. Great. <laughs> Really <laughs> that's, that's quite likely to be there. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's say, yeah. yeah. I think you, you'd, um, Mr. Griffith, who I don't know if any of you know, gave a lecture similar to this and did put the geodesine in between the right upper quadrant and the right lower quadrant, so I think that's fine. Um, anyone else have any advances on anything in there? Right kidney, it's, yeah, yeah. Quite, quite possibly, you might get it's. This is this is where it falls down. I won't be talking about um, gynaecology stuff today, and I won't be talking about renal stuff today. But um, it's always good to have right and left lumbar or right and left loin when you're talking about kidneys. If you're starting putting in right upper or lower quadrant, they're not going to be happy. So in that way, but yes, half of it's going to be in right. Quadrant, yes. Okay. So would you mind picking a, a letter for me? D. Yeah. <laughs> D6. Okay, the gentleman beside her in the in the maroon hoodie. That would be. Easy. Um, give me a few in the left upper quadrant that might cause the acute abdomen. Spleen is there, unlikely to cause the acute abdomen. Anything else? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's in, it's epigastric, but I haven't asked you that, so that's fine. Yeah, kind of in the middle. Yep. Fine. Good. Yeah. The other name for the uh, left upper quadrant, which is, is also written here, is the left hypochondriac. Um, Mr. Griffith, when he was giving a lecture similar to this, uh, simply said, when, when he asked us what's in the left upper quadrant, simply said, it's left hypochondriac. They're moaning about nothing. Send them home. I then asked him what about the right, uh, right hypochondriac. He said, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's the same word. Don't know why. It's, it's okay with the left. Um, so left, you're, you're unlikely to get anything particularly acute, Yasmin. Epigastric region, do you mind picking a letter for me? Yep. F3, lady in the black jumper. Uh, y yeah, yeah, definitely. So things like duodenal losses, peptic ulcers, that sort of thing, fine. Yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. 
Good. Um, right, left lower quadrant. Same again. Just in terms of the uh, of the acute abdomen that you can think of. Diverticulitis, yeah, yeah, definitely. That's probably the only one you're going to see in the left lower quadrant. What do you need to be careful about, particularly with, with uh, this model? What would you need to be careful about in the left and right quadrant, lower quadrants? Ectopic pregnancies, yeah. Um, a friend of mine was working down in London and his reg sent someone home who uh, just thought it was kind of niggling um, uh, infection type pain and uh, sent them home. They collapsed and died in the parking lot and in the car park from um, uh, from a rupture of a pregnancy. There was a big inquiry into it. It's get a pregnancy test is my best piece of advice. Just make sure there's a pregnancy test done. Right, can you give me a letter? Yep. Yeah. Uh, gentleman in the glasses and black shirt. Yep. Uh, right, lower quadrant. Probably the best one, easiest one. Appendix. Brilliant. Yep. Yeah. Similar to the left lower quadrant, you've got to think about the uh, right ovary and the um, right kidney. Fine. For your for your learning, when Ever you see the um, this lecture when it's emailed out to you? This is the list. There's a whole huge list of things um, on this one, so you can uh, have a look at that at your own time. Fine. Case study number three. Uh, gentleman in the black shirt. You got off quite easy with the appendix. 22-year-old female presents to A&E with 24-hour history of right iliac fossa pain. She's, she's lost her appetite and is complaining of nausea. Lying on her side and is very reluctant to be examined. Okay, so. Uh, doesn't want to be examined, so she's not going to let you near her. Leave me alone. What's the first thing that's going to have been done before you already get there, before you even get there? Yeah, well, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yes, brilliant. Um, you definitely need to do that. I was thinking of OBS, but yeah. Um, <laughs> working fast there. Fine. So, blood pressure 110 over 75, 22-year-old female. Are you happy with that? Yeah, fa yeah, I'm fairly happy with that. Respiratory rate of 22, slightly high. Nothing to hugely worried about. But again, remember what I said earlier. Respiratory rate is the first thing to go off. Oxygen sats, 98%. Absolutely fine. Temperature, 38.4. What do we think of that? That's a bit high. Okay, fine. So we next do some bloods. Just come back. HB of 110. How do we feel about that? In the black shirt. How do we feel about that guy in the black shirt? Slightly low, yeah. For a 22 year old female, could be fair, it could be normal, could be fine. Right cell count 14.2, how do you feel about that? It's a bit high, it is It is a bit high, yeah. Um, CRP? It is a bit high again, right. So the white cells and CRP inflammatory markers are both up. What are we thinking at this point? I can, I can hear people whispering it. You, you all know it, appendicitis. Right, fine. Pregnancy test negative. There you go, fine. So, appendicitis, which I'm going to just whiz through it because I'm sure you all know it, starts umbilical, migrates to the right iliac fossa, associated with guarding and peritonism. Um, decreased appetite is, is very diagnostic in appendicitis, um, particularly in children. You come across a child who's, who's um, eating and drinking, um, and complaining of rightly at fossil pain, don't ever dismiss it, but it's unlikely to be appendicitis. Um, does anyone know one of the most common differential diagnoses for a child with, I heard someone say it, who was that? Mesenteric adenitis, right. What's, what's that for everyone else that's here? Okay, it's the, it, uh, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, but it, it's the, as far as I'm aware, it's the aftermath of a viral infection which uh, makes the lymph nodes enlarge. That causes very similar pain to appendicitis. It waxes and wanes. So a patient will be up wandering around 20 minutes and then will be lying in agony. That's not appendicitis. Right, it's the most commonly a clinical diagnosis. Uh, the senior surgeons will come, they'll see it, they'll say, right, let's get into surgery, whip it out. Um, I mistakenly on my first day sent someone for an ultrasound scan 
just to let you know now that's a useless test and the surgeons will rip it out of you when you come back and the ultrasound scan says well it doesn't look like appendicitis but I can't rule it out it's what it will say with every single scan don't do it because you'll get shouted at um, everyone knows where McBurney's point is I imagine from the nods I imagine yes yeah I'm sure that's fine Rothsing sign everyone's aware of so you press on the opposite side you get the pain referred there fine brilliant great case study four gentleman in the black shirt would you mind picking a letter for me a, yes, back to the beginning. What number? A6, one, two, three, four, five, six. Gentleman in the glasses. So, 46 year old office worker presents A &E with sudden onset epigastric pain. When he comes to see him, he's in obvious pain and lying still on the trolley. A brief abdominal examination reveals peritonism. Firstly, what's peritonism? It's pain throughout the abdomen. It's rigid rigid abdominal pain it's like um, they, they call it what is it called um, uh, it's board board like rigidity I think it's called board rigidity um, you can get it if you're examining a patient lying down I can't move too far from the microphone if you're examining a patient lying down um, and you're doing um, percussion on their on their abdomen um, peritonism you'll get the tenderness all over when doing percussion that's the best way to check for peritonism Okay, so this gentleman's OBS, um, BP 98 over 70, 46 year old gentleman, are we happy with that? It's a bit on the low side, isn't it? Yeah, so heart rate of 140, I can imagine we're definitely not happy with that. Respiratory rate of 26, fairly unhappy with that too. Temperature 37.8, fine. His blood's come back very, very quickly, HB of 120. It's not particularly low. This is a 46 year old gentleman with sudden onset epigastric pain. A drop in HB is <coughs> unlikely to, to be present at this point, is it? He's had, an, he's had an acute bleed of some variety. What two things, that, well, at least what two things are on your mind at the minute? Sorry? Perforated ulcer, that's number one on my dif listed list of differential diagnosis. There's one that's much less common, but much more dangerous. I heard the gentleman say AAA. Um, if you're if you're thinking AAA, get someone there now, because um, this patient's basically on his last legs. Unlikely to be AAA presents with a, they they commonly say a tearing a tear they can literally feel it tearing a tearing pain radiating to the back incredible pain they're in agony and they their BP would likely be a lot lower than this I think. Uh, any investigations you'd want in terms of um, imaging? Chest, yep, chest film. Uh, would it be erect or lying down? Or? Yeah, brilliant. Erect chest x-ray and abdominal x-ray. Um, most surgical patients, you'll get an abdominal x-ray anyway, um, but you're unlikely to see anything. What are we looking for? Who can tell me what's going on here? A bit louder. I heard someone say pneumothorax. <laughs> No, good, yeah. Okay, um, gentleman in the glasses, would you mind giving me a letter and a number? Oh, back row, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, Asian lady in the back row, second from left. What are we doing with this x-ray? W what does it show? A double bubble, I've never heard that before. What's um, a double bubble? Okay, I'm, I'm assuming the double bubble you're referring to the perforation and the air under the diaphragm. Um, this, I wasn't allowed, I wasn't allowed to take the, uh, the x-ray from the lady I mentioned earlier, but it looks very similar to this. Um, if you see, if you see this, are we worried? Yes, this is a surgical emergency. Get help now. Okay, so perforated peptic ulcers, like I said, intense abdominal pain can be can be quite easily associate, uh, confused with AAA. Uh, signs similar to what the patient presented with. Requires resus, emergency surgery, IV PPI, IV pantoprazole, 40 milligrams, etc. Another tip, I think, learn your doses of the common drugs, because while they're not particularly useful for your exams, incredibly useful for FY1, 
because you walking around with a BNF to the nurses at three in the morning doesn't look good. Um, and nurses are very, very, very helpful. Make friends quickly. Um, they will get you out of a lot of trouble. But at the same time, take what they say with a pinch of salt. Um, I, I, last week I had a patient who was on... Um, uh, 10, millig uh, 10 milliliters of um, Movicol. I think 10 milliliters of, no, 10 milliliters of Lactulose. Yeah, that was it. So it, I don't know if anyone's ever seen Lactulose. It's a very syrupy kind of thick, um, uh, thick liquid. And uh, she was trying to get it down into a patient's NG tube. One of my colleagues had written 30 mils down and she had taken it as 80. And the first thing I heard of it was her coming up to me with this big fuck off syringe full of <laughs> full of lachulo saying this is really difficult to get down the uh, ng tube and i was <laughs> i just like you know thank god it's not a dangerous uh, yeah thank god it's not dangerous anyway um they're very very useful but at four in the morning you want to rely on something you've learned here rather than you know something that they've learned over most of them are very very good but some of them heads are in the clouds a little bit anyway empirical antibiotics depends where you are in uh, Bradford, it's uh, Kef and Met. Learn your um, uh, drug regimes in your... <coughs> what do you want to do? <laughs> You're getting a pretty easy ride, actually. <laughs> you do all do AMDO, actually. Because you've got such an easy ride, there's only one sign in here that I want you to pick up. Uh, you, I, I've, I've spoken to the people doing these lectures, and they've said that you'll be getting an, a, a proper lecture on x-ray, so we won't go through them to any, any great detail. What one sign can you see here? I can hear some people saying it. Okay, so this is it. This is a, a fairly obvious small bowel obstruction, and you can tell that by the, the, the stacked coin appearance mm -hmm. of the small bowel. It does look like a roll of coins. Okay, I, I, I have to sympathize with you. I find abdominal x-rays very difficult to interpret. I only know it because I put it up there. So don't, don't worry too much. Um, okay, so bowel obstruction, uh, difference between sort of large and small bowel obstruction. Small bowel obstruction will tend to present with a very colicky type on and off pain. Um, it will present very quickly, they'll start to vomit. Anyone seen fecal vomit? Fecal vomit's incredible. Um, <laughs> surgical, uh, as a surgical F1, you'll be putting in Riles tubes, uh, so decompression NG tubes, on a daily basis. My second best bit of advice is to wear two aprons and wear something on your shoes and bring two of those little bowls okay one one for one for under their chin and one for your chest because it's the uh, apart from melina it's the most horrible thing you can get on yourself um and i've had both of them on me uh yeah it's horrible um right so you're uh listening to the bowel you'll hear um either absent bowel sounds which is bad or you'll hear kind of tinkling type bowel sounds which is more of a sign of a partial obstruction um, there can be mechanic mechanical versus functional. Anyone know what I mean by that? The lady nodded her head and I just begged to be asked the question. Um, mechanical versus functional, what do I mean? Yeah? Yeah, so like an ileus, something functional. Happens very commonly after surgery, you'll get people two or three days not pooing nothing huge to worry about depends on the surgery obviously but nothing huge to worry about um right uh, remember electrolytes yeah people's electrolytes tend to go off either through vomiting or through lack of absorption so just make sure you're doing daily electrolytes on these beach patients um treatment you're, you're looking at surgery really depending on what's going on if it's um if it's like a, a volvulus or you know a, a strangulated hernia etc you're looking at surgery um for purposes of overnight you can give them an ng tube um just to get rid of the pressure because it's a very uncomfortable feeling from what from what i've seen anyway right so case study number six would you mind giving me a letter and number please e1 e1 uh, e1 over there a gentleman in the blue shirt so 50 year old housewife from essex with a bmi of 35 comes into SAU complaining of right upper quadrant pain. This is constant in nature and began yesterday after she'd finished her Friday fish and chips. Right, so you might be able to read between the lines, literally. 
Brilliant. Great. Fine. So 50 female fat and fair, quite in, in my experience anyway, is, is actually right on the money. So uh, this patient OBS yeah. are normal. This patient bloods. What do we make of those bloods? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly ALP it. ALP is a little high. Um, I won't ask you to name the, the values. That, that's how you... you, you <laughs> it is 30. You're, 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 you're right on the money. It's definitely 30. Um, I'll, I'll get you out of that. That's fine. ALT is fine in that, in that situation. Do you know what ALT would be a sign of, a raised ALT? Anyone can help them out? Or? So that yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So um, ART is more for um, hepatocyte damage, whereas ALP is more like a blockage, etc. Fine. So what scans are we looking at for this patient? What's the very first scan you want to do for this patient? Ultrasound scan. And where are we ultrasounding? OK, so you just want to ask for an ultrasound abdomen. They'll do the whole lot. Um, First of all, what uh, the guy in the blue shirt again? What what are we looking for? You, you you've said it already, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. Very tree. Um, yeah, brilliant. Do you know the the standard diameter of the CBD? <laughs> that's that's that, that's a good answer. You you shouldn't know. I, I heard someone say it. Did someone just say it? Yeah, five millimeters. Brilliant. You need to get out more. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm only joking, sorry. Um, right, so scans. Ultrasound reveals a CBD of 12 millimetres. Is that big? Yep. So that's got a stone in situ. Multiple stones in the gallbladder. Right, so what do we now need to do for this lady? She's still in agony. What's the first thing we need to do? Analgesia, exactly. Analgesia, um, you need to tell her to stop eating the fish and chips, which she's still got with her. They constantly do that. Um, take those off her. Give us some analgesia, IVI. Um, then more long term, so tomorrow, what does she need to have done? ERCP. Would anyone do her MRCP? Maybe. One guy says maybe. Why do you say maybe? That's, that's a good point. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good point. But. Uh, CT, when they're doing the, the ERCP, the CT wouldn't necessarily, it, it very much depends on how old the fetus is. Over five or six months, you wouldn't care about that. You need to get rid of it. Um, not the baby, the stone. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, right, so e main differences between ERCP and MRCP. What are they? Yep. MRCP, do you do anything invasive? Um, no. So are you going to do anything for this lady by doing an MRCP? No. ERCP all the way. Um, there we go. Fine. Brilliant. So gallstones. Cholelithiasis, which is gallstones. Cholecystitis, which is inflammation. And cholangitis, which is infection. Just get those into your head because they confuse me for the whole of fifth year. Um, normally presents with right upper quadrant pain, waxing and waning. Does anyone understand why the pain does what it does? People call it biliary colic but it's not colic. What is colic? Yeah, brilliant. So it's, it's, it, it, in terms of symptoms, it's, it's a pain that, pain that comes and goes. It comes because of a, for a number of reasons. Normally, con contraction of a muscle, etc., like um, in, in the renal tract, contraction of a muscle around a stone. Um, when you get cholelithiasis, you've got the gallbladder, which is full of lovely little gallstones and you've got the CBD which is nice and patent someone comes along they have their fish and chips the gallbladder realizes it's quite a fatty meal I need to give some bile to the, stu to the stomach um, then it's pushing out all this bile one of the gallstones pops up lodges itself in the gallbladder you get this incredible pain because your body is still producing bile and you're getting this inflammation horrible feeling you get this pain for hours and hours and hours 18 hours and it shoots right up and it, and it whacks it it, 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 it it comes to a plateau and then the gallbladder, the gallstone falls back into the gallbladder and the pain goes away. So in that way, the pain does come and go, but it's over a huge long period of time. And it's not, the, it's not a colicky pain that people do call it biliary colic. I'm getting off topic. 
Um, diagnosed via ultrasound scan. You can give antibiotics in uh, Bradford. We give um, Kef and Met. Cholangitis. Does anyone know Charcot's triad? Fevers, rigor, and jaundice. It's uh, brilliant. Well done. Um, MRT fever. That's fine. Done. Um, in the end, with this patient, because you've got loads of stones, you're going to want to do a cholestectomy. Right, we are at the last case study. Have I still got time? No, I haven't. My God, I'm running well over. Right. Um, this same patient presents post the RCP with epigastric pain radiating to the back. Why has she done that? What, what test do we need to do now? Blood test. Amylase. Brilliant. Great. So, pancreatitis. For the last person, can you please give me a name and a, num uh, a number and a letter? Gentleman in blue shirt will be two or three minutes. E4, one, two, uh, A, B, C, D, E4, one, two, three, four, I've had you, one, two, three, four. Lady in the hoodie and glasses. Okay, so, etiology. I, idiopathic. Do we know the eye gets smashed? Okay, so, G, gallstones, yep. Let's all, let, let's all just, let's all just get through this. So, G, gallstones, E, T, S. Scorpions isn't the first one. <laughs> You're not going to get scorpions in Leeds or Bradford. But I, I, I was tempted to put it as the first one. If you see scorpions in the question, you don't need to read the rest of it, I don't think. Right, steroids is the first S. Um, M, mumps, brilliant. A, Ooh. <laughs> autoimmune, brilliant, good. Uh, S. Scorpions, yeah, great. Um, H, I heard hypers, yes. So hyperlipidemia and hypercalcemia, metabolic diseases. Uh, ERCP, which you all knew, and D, drugs. Brilliant, great. So the Glasgow score, something again you need to be aware of, it's just whether or not you need to discuss with HDU. Uh, you, you just need to be aware of it, you don't need to be able to um, do it. Uh, management, not by mouth and NG tube, plus or minus, it depends on where you are. Appropriate analgesia and antibiotics, if necessary, it's unlikely in most cases. The role of the F1, okay, so this is, a, this is the last slide. Um, every patient, good history, good examination, no by mouth, you need to get the proper tests off, full blood count. Um, I'd say in surgery, just get a cross match, get a group and save on everyone. Appropriate imaging, um, so the things we've talked about, ultrasound versus uh, ERCP versus x-ray, abdominal, chest, etc. IVI and analgesia are incredibly important because you're going to be putting these people nil by mouth. If you leave someone overnight nil by mouth, they're going to become dehydrated. The little old lady, 92 years old, she hasn't had her cup of tea, she turns up in the morning and her kidneys have failed because you haven't given her any, any IVI. Okay, any questions? Very quickly because I know I've run over. Brilliant. Okay, thanks very much and good luck. <laughs>